So we have about 40 minutes or 45 minutes for questions. And um, I mean, it seems to me that there could be questions on a very wide range of topics about how this uh, program sits within other research programs on growth, um, on the research content, obviously, the, um, the themes and the questions, and also the, the approach. Uh, 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 and Maureen uh, illustrated that uh, very nicely from her, her program. And I think the balance between research capacity building, impact, and partnerships, all those sorts of things, and also on the process of applying for the research. So, I mean, there's, there's, the scope is wide open, really. As I said earlier on, it's on the record. We have roving microphones, I think. And um, what I'd like you to do, uh, if you would like to ask a question, is stick your hand up, wait until you get a microphone, and then uh, say you're, you're well, probably better if you stand up. Um, we would have liked to have stood up, but if we stand up, we get completely dazzled by the screen, the projector, and you can't see the screen. We're anyway uh, elevated. Um, uh, strangely. Anyway, so stand up, say your name, uh, and, and, and say your question, and we'll take four or five questions, and then we'll come back to the appropriate person to answer them. And it would be quite good if we can try and keep questions sort of thematic. So um, if, we, if, if somebody asks a question about procedure, then let's have some procedural questions. Uh, but also, we want to be pragmatic about, we don't want to be passing the microphone from one end of the room to the other. So let's see what happens. I can see a hand starting to go up there, two hands here. Let's start with those two, and one at the back. Let's take those three. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Laura Turley. I'm from the International Institute for Sustainable Development. Um, and I have three questions, and they're of the procedural nature, so I don't know if I'm uh, taking up too much here, but uh, here we go. Um, first of all, a question regarding, um, I, th I think it was actually answered already by you, Mr. Corbell, but um, to follow up, we are an international research institute. Do we need a UK research partner, as it seems many of the previous uh, successful applicants did have a UK element, and I think the answer to this is, is no, but is there um, a, a way for sharing research interests with other potential uh, p partners? in the process leading up to this uh, April 25th deadline. Um, secondly, um, just taking a glance at the uh, previous project winners as well, um, is there any trend in research methodologies? And if there's no trend, I mean, what is the sort of spectrum um, that you have? And finally, a question on um, uh, the case for support. If there was just if, if, uh, an example, I mean, is this uh, also an opportunity for uh, demonstrating country support, letters of support from partners, or is this strictly a sort of a, a further summary of what we'll be, we'll be doing? Thank you. Very good. Uh, Michael. My name is Michael Lipton. I'm a research professor of economics at the University of Sussex and also an advisor to the program. And I also have three questions. Um, <laughs> One is about data. Um, many of you will know the recent book, very recent book by Morton Yervin called Poor Numbers about Sub-Saharan Africa. And that is one powerful critique of all data relating to GDP and growth in Sub-Saharan Africa. But there are others. There are complete internal inconsistencies, especially for the largest African countries, with the exception perhaps of Kenya between the national income data and the domestic product data, what we know about the difference between them and the reported differences between them. And there is also the question, particularly serious for the agriculture component of this project, of the near worthlessness of most of the smallholder food production data for all except a very small number of countries in sub-Saharan Africa, and the increasing and often not random worthlessness. Now, the operational question is, what should people conducting work on growth and the causes of growth and the role of agriculture in growth and of agricultural alternatives in growth, what should they do about this? Should they be asked to specify the sensitivity of their results to bad data? And of course, let us not have the answer that this is all micro and these growth issues are macro and in a way you can sum up the micro stuff because that won't do except on absurdly strong assumptions about externalities, which I think none of us here would be willing to make. So what is going to be done about making this research link up with the appalling quality of basic data on both growth and agricultural production in a large majority, especially of large, low-income countries? Um, the second question is about the nature of the agricultural research program. 
Now, that's very fascinating, but that program addresses, and I would say is almost a counter-revolution against what has happened in the analysis of agricultural development in the last 40 years or so. I should really say since uh, uh, Ted Schultz is transforming traditional agriculture in 1964. That model has been of principally technical constraints to, small, to the progress of inherently efficient smallholders in a situation of functioning or potentially functioning markets for agricultural products to get agriculture mo moving and raise economic growth. Now that's of course a very happy state of affairs if true because it means that doing things that are good for equity will also be good for efficiency and vice versa. Smallholders, agriculture, employment, um, poor people, and also agricultural growth, strong growth linkages. Now that's been the whole the story so far. Now there's a powerful challenge mounted to that story and reading between the lines of the research outline uh, of, of this program, this core, it looks to me as if that powerful challenge has been largely bought by the people who have designed this call. Now, I just want to report the fact, not uh, discuss it if you like, that the evidence for this counter-revolution is extremely weak. The evidence for the main propositions of technological limitation and small farm advantage in lower unit transactions costs and agricultural growth linkages is very powerful and it's been built up over hundreds if not thousands of case studies over the last 50 years. And in the last 10 years, those case studies have taken very careful note of the endogeneity issues and multicollinearity issues, which were the subject of justified earlier criticism. So I very much hope that people, as it were, buying into that counter-revolution will look at some of the earlier evidence, not necessarily that much earlier. The last handbook of Aggie Con, summary articles on, for example, plantations and farm size and a number of other things. One cannot make, I think, the assumptions that are made here. Third thing, very small, very short point, it's going to be necessary to link up not just with African countries, but with the principal African-based agricultural research and development institutions. And I refer specifically to CADAP for all its problems and AGRA, the Alliance for a Green Revolution in, Agri in, Agri in Africa. Now these are quite well financed, they've got quite a long way, and they do, as it were, embody a research-based approach in the agricultural sector to the agriculture growth nexus. And I think it's going to be quite important that the projects in this program link up with that. Very good. Thank you very much, Michael. And there was a hand at the back. Let's have that one, and then I think we might go through, because uh, we've got quite a lot of questions already. Um, I hope you've only got one. I don't actually. I have four, but they're very good. <laughs> I don't think okay, three are procedural. Um, I just was wondering, you said that uh, you're going to consider in the first, in, sorry, my name is Marcella Vignera, I'm an independent researcher. Uh, you mentioned that in the first instance you're going to be considering around 40, 45 uh, proposals. So is the idea uh, that the council will um, uh, consider an equal proportion of proposals under each theme or uh, not necessarily? Uh, just to understand, you know, um, what the thinking is. Now, the second one is that um, in your uh, documentation, you mention about the gender issue that has to be sort of, uh, the proposal has to have, to have a very clear attitude about whether there is any gender dimension in the research, um, and that has to be differentiated uh, very clearly. Is that an essential requirement, even if the proposal will not look specifically at gender issues? Um, and the other two very quick questions are, um, the case of support is only a two-page proposal. So I'm just wondering, you have pretty detailed criteria. Are you allocating specific weights to those criteria uh, so that one can prioritize one criteria over the other? And if yes, could you please state them? And lastly, um, the majority of the proposals will have to deal with low-income countries but an exception will be made for middle-income countries, uh, which are a learning case for uh, low-income countries to do the transition. So if that is the case, because that's what I'm proposing to do, are there any key elements that will make a particularly strong case for a middle-income country to be a case study for the proposal? Um, okay, well, I'm not, I'm not gonna repeat all the questions. Uh, I'm just gonna <laughs> allow the panel to, to answer them, I think one by one really pick them off and I'm going to check that they're all answered and if you duck a question I'm going to direct it at somebody so quite a lot of them were sort of procedural ones so yeah luckily um, and, and luckily I did bring my colleagues uh, 
Lenny and Mary, uh, <laughs> who are probably in a much better place than me as answering them. So Laura's question about um, international research institutions versus um, UK-based, or having a UK partner, we, as you answered the question yourself, we, uh, it co could come from anywhere. You don't need to have a UK uh, partner. And um, in terms of um, ways to uh, well, link up beforehand, before you submit your, your proposal, I'm, I'm not sure if someone else is better placed to, to answer that. We, I'm not sure we at the ESRC necessarily, necessarily have a mechanism to, to support that. So we, our hope would be that through events like this, um, com communication conversations do start also online and uh, that the directorate can also facilitate uh, this to some extent. Um, John, is that uh, something that... I was going to ask Louise or Dirk to say something about that. Yeah. Okay, well, uh, well, let's come back to Dirk at the end. I mean, I okay, think right. Broadly and um, I think there was a, a, your question <coughs> about a trends in research methodology and what kind of things we, we're seeing at the moment. I'm not aware of any trends if you're referring to, for example, qualitative towards RCT, um, that whole debate. What, what I would say is that um, you need to choose the most appropriate methodology and we will scrutinize that. We will not give specific preference just because it's an invoke uh, methodology just now. We are not going to be prescriptive um, in terms of mixed versus uh, qualitative versus quantitative proportions. So that's all open and depends on appropriateness for your question, if that makes sense. Um, the case for support, um, it is quite short. We don't expect any letters of support as far as I'm aware at this stage. Is that correct? Um, in, in the actual case for support document. Um, y if you have anything, attach it by any means. Uh, is that possible even? Yes. You yes. Can have a letter of support if you wish, but only where it's really appropriate. Because it's certainly not mandatory yeah. to include a support letter unless you feel it's going I mean, in some ways, it would sort of uh, highlight that you've actually made contact with the people you want to work with already. So that can be helpful, but it's not a requirement as such. Um, John, the data question, I'm not sure no, I'm, I'm qualified. I, I was going to ask Dirk to comment on that. Um, good. Uh, th thank you very much. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll answer that question then on the um, um, on data. Um, uh, data is a very important uh, part of, uh, um, uh, of of this uh, of this call, and we, we had some some discussion on that, um, and um, uh, with, within the call, and um, uh, basically uh, you need to of course consider the quality of the data and whether it's appropriate for for the research that you're going to undertake. Uh, some questions uh, are more data intensive than others. Um, and uh, for instance, for the innovation part, we, there are some questions that you can only do really with long run data, uh, long runs of data. Now, there, uh, there are various databases that you can use, of course, at the macro sites. And there is, uh, I'm afraid I have to say, the, mi the micro level databases as well. Um, and they are um, uh, being collected increasingly and, uh, and also DFID. I'm, uh, maybe you want to say more on that, Stefan, but, it, uh, Stephen, but it's, it's also supporting, uh, uh, for instance, the World Bank uh, and other. Uh, other institutions in, in, uh, in collecting uh, data sets that you can use, and we've provided a link to, um, uh, to, to those data sets. And of course, uh, within the proposal, I mean, these, these are quite uh, uh, nicely sized projects, you can build in data collection. And there, is, there, there are various projects within the first call that actually have a, a, one of the core components is building up uh, a database with long run data that can, uh, that can think through questions about structural change. And, um, and, and they, they're really going back to the types of, uh, types of uh, questions on data. Um, I mentioned one issue within innovation. There is one paper in particular that, that, that questions really about, um, about how can you measure productivity? Can you do it in economic terms or in do you need to do it in physical terms? Um, there, in, there, there are proposals that go in, in, in that direction. So you can do uh, really a lot, I think, uh, uh, think uh, if you think through uh, those questions. Uh, uh, so, so you can build it into your proposals yourself. You can make sure that you, be, you use the latest data sets available um, uh, um, and, uh, and make sure that you, um, um, you build on that. And 
um, uh, that's, that's what I can say, and I think uh, I'm happy to answer more questions. I see you uh, <laughs> vaguely nodding uh, about this. Uh, also, methodologies. I think it's uh, the same. The same answer. I think it's there. There are a range of methodologies available. Uh, we've mentioned RCTs. We've mentioned uh, the econometric techniques. There are qualitative uh, studies, uh, and uh, it's up to you to decide and to make the case that whatever you your approach you take is the most appro uh, appropriate to the to the research question. Um, and that's that's that, that's very important. But at least that you're aware of, of of all the latest techniques that are that are available to answer them. Uh, the questions. Um, finally, about partnerships, there was a question. Um, um, well, there's also a, a, an email address um, uh, through which you can uh, reach the directorate, and we're happy to help out. Um, so, in, in, in all, uh, we, we're happy to help out uh, as, as and when we can do that. Uh, we need to, of course, be neutral uh, to, and helpful to all applicants. Um, um, but we, we're happy to help out as, as and when we can and consider your questions on, on, uh, on partnerships. Okay, Stephen and sure. Helmut want to say something <coughs> about data, I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, Wait. one or two other things. So, so I think Dirk uh, answered, is this on? I think Dirk answered well on, on data. I would just say, you know, don't devise a research <coughs> strategy which is dependent on very unreliable data sets. Um, so uh, you were talking about unreliability of GDP. I, I'm sure that's true in, in most dimensions. Um, um, you know, it's unreliability of uh, uh, the level of GDP is unreliable. Cross countries uh, comparisons are very unreliable. Maybe they, maybe uh, uh, fluctuations in the rate of growth, a bit more meaningful sometimes, but you have to be careful about it. Agricultural production in aggregate for countries is even worse, uh, and that's what you're saying. So you know, try and avoid uh, uh, research uh, that depends on those data sets. I think, I think there's uh, plenty in the. Uh, you were talking mainly about agriculture, I think, and I think there's plenty in the agriculture uh, core here that you could be investigated without uh, uh, using those sorts of data sets, you know, some, a lot of it's about uh, changing the type of uh, agriculture. Um, anyway, that's a challenge for the researchers, but uh, I think, you know, you've got to be careful that the data quality is sufficient. And I was just going to say there's also a very uh, uh, a good question about um, MIC case studies, middle income country case studies. So, you know, personally, I do think they can be very relevant. You know, these are the countries sometimes which have uh, made a transition from low income uh, status. So, in their recent history, sometimes they hold a lot of information. Though, of course, a lot of mix have not really made that transition recently. Um, I think the thing to say is, really, there just has to be a bit of a higher standard to justify doing uh, uh, something which is mainly or entirely based in a middle-income country. So it's got to be really very clearly relevant, very clearly high-quality and promising uh, research avenue to basically there's a higher hurdle to, uh, a higher bar uh, for doing something which is only a middle-income um, if you mix in some low income middle countries together, you know, that's also maybe makes the case a bit easier. Very good, thanks. Helmut, you want to say something? Yeah, uh, first, a remark on data. Uh, there is this initiative uh, which is also funded by DFID, uh, Paris 21, which is uh, housed at the OECD but which uh, involves a lot of statistical offices of sub Saharan low income countries. And it is uh, certainly worth to look uh, into their website and uh, to, to see to what extent data have been consolidated. So for people who want to work on a cross-country basis, that may be quite interesting. Uh, another issue, uh, 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 to, to the, uh, another answer to the question of uh, middle-income countries, I think there are a lot of lower middle-income countries that have graduated only recently from low-income country status. And uh, these are certainly interesting, especially if you look at the structural economics perspective, uh, where Lynn, for example, has, uh, is advising countries to look at similar countries that are now uh, lower, lower middle income countries, have the same factor proportions and the same uh, potential comparative advantages to emulate their development paths. For example, if you do research in that area, it's certainly very helpful uh, to identify cluster of countries that could follow a similar policy that countries have been following that have been successful. Very good. Uh, Steve, do you want to pick up the agriculture stuff or, or comment on it? And also, <laughs> what about the link up with CADEP and AGRA that Michael was talking about? 
Okay, Professor Lipton has put out some, some very challenging comments there on, on, on agriculture. All, all I will say in, in reply to that is, is more succinctly. Um, if anybody's wondering about the kind of research that gets funded by the Growth Research Program, of the original 18 grants, nine are in the agriculture field. And if you have a look through that, there's a pleasingly diverse range of projects. Yes, there's four of them that deal with microeconomic issues of farm production, village-level economics. There's three of them that look at supply chains, wider links in the, in the rural economy. And there's two which look at critical institutions of the governance of land and, and, and water. So, so it's certainly not wedded to any particular set of methods or necessarily any particular way of looking at what agricultural d development should be. But I would say that on the, on, on the data, I think almost all of them are generating their own data, well aware that existing data sets are, are probably not strong enough. Uh, if you can get a microphone, you can, yes. Oh, I'm sure that the projects which get support under this program will be very careful about the data they collect and careful to specify what data they need to collect. My problem is rather different. If the attempt is to measure the impact on growth by looking on pa either at past data or at future data when they come out, that depends on those, pa those future aggregate data, either for GDP or for agricultural production, being reliable what's to happen if they're not reliable and if the prospects for their being reliable or becoming reliable are pretty bad? Um, I, th I, think, I th think that's a question for, for the program to look at uh, through the duration of the program, probably. Um, shall I just answer very quickly the question about linking up with Africa-based research institutes? That's one of the functions of the directorate, and also linking up with other researchers is to facilitate those sorts of linkages, and there'll be various things going on. We'll be holding workshops in developing countries and here and we'll be following up, trying to develop one-to-one -one relationships with all of the researchers and finding out what they're doing and who they're working with and thinking about who else uh, we might be able to, to link them up to. There were some three quite uh, quick questions at the end, I think, from Marcella. Number of proposals under each theme. Does gender and the other cross-cutting issues have to be explicit in each proposal? Uh, wait, uh, wait to the criteria. But let me first um, add to what Stephen said about um, middle-income country versus low-income country. As per our specifications, you need to make a case for um, just doing your research in middle-income countries. You need to demonstrate that there is relevance to low-income countries. Um, so I think we, we need to be very clear about that. Um, right, so the proportion across the themes. I said our budget would allow us to, to fund around 45 um, shortlists, sorry, God, I wish, um, 45 uh, shortlist, 45 projects, depending on the size, obviously. Um, we are not going to, to say a third needs to be agriculture, a third needs to be finance. It would be great if we had more finance applications than we got in the, in the previous round. Um, every project will be uh, judged on its merit, on its scientific merit. Um, we're going to give you, well, we, we're giving you these questions to work with. What you do with it is up to you. We're not going to uh, do any waiting in terms of that. In terms of um, disaggregation of, of data, of gender data, for example, um, of course, if it's not relevant to the question you're studying, then uh, Maybe the outline proposal is not the right forum to discuss that, but we want to see evidence that you have considered um, gender and, and uh, other data, um, if that makes sense. So if you, if you make reference to that, uh, that would be important. In terms of um, how we weight the different assessment criteria, um, there's no, in, in terms of how we draw together the scores and all that, there's no particular weighting, but of course, the primary <coughs> aims we want to see is the highest possible standard in terms of the research and the potential for impact on policy and practice. So these are really the pillars of what your, what your research needs to do. Um, so this is kind of implicit uh, waiting, if you wish. Um, and I think that's, that's it. That's it yep. Okay, I mean, I, I, I think that covers most of the things. If anybody feels their question wasn't answered, stay for tea and nail them afterwards. I see two more hands. 
three or four hands on this side. We've had quite a lot from this side. One on this side, only one on this side. Okay, let's go up this side and finish up at the back on that side and we'll collect those questions. That was the lady in front, Caroline, I think. May I come last, please? Okay. <laughs> Microphone handler, please manage that. Sorry. Um, I'm, I'm Simon, uh, working at Oxford at the moment. Thank you very much for your time in explaining this today. We obviously talked about three themes and then underneath that there were specific questions and there's been some reference to a proposal addressing one or more themes. But I was interested to hear more about the flexibility that you think you might have in that case. So for example, we could imagine the possibility of thinking about innovation in financial services, which no one wants to talk about in London, of course, but might be very, very important for growth and poor people in a lot of low-income countries and might overlap innovation and financial themes, but wouldn't necessarily fit under any of the questions that were discussed under either innovation or finance. I guess I'm, I'm wondering what your general sense is to how flexible you would be in thinking about those kind of cross-cutting issues, or whether we have, if we're doing issues that cross-cut themes, they also have to relate directly to, for example, structural regulation and crises and the specific issues that were outlined today. Thank you. Was there another hand in the middle? Yes, it wasn't the lady who wants to go last. There we go. Hello, hi, I'm Christian from the uh, LSE. I was wondering, it seems the call is quite embedded in the economics literature. Um, so how do you treat, let's say, if you have kind of literatures around management, sociology, do you discount these if they don't have direct references to these economic literatures? Or a uh, second part of the question, do you, if you had a topic specifically in the innovation uh, part, which is around business model innovation, which then looks a bit more kind of on the organizational level, the dynamics within, but then have implications for policy. Is that a bit too far away or does that still uh, go into the call if there are clear policy recommendations? Thank you. John, did you have your hand up? No? Oh, sorry. Okay, back over there. Thank you. Uh, Bruce Langford, you did. Sorry, University of East Anglia. My question is also about a concern over disciplinarity. Um, having worked on irrigation in sub-Saharan Africa for many decades now, it's my view that it's uh, a sector that you come to through a number of different disciplines, engineering, natural resources, uh, social sciences. Um, I'm therefore concerned that the one of the guidelines was that the bid should have at least 50% social science. And therefore, if I'm going up against a competitor bid, if I take my mixed methods approach, will I <coughs> lose out to an approach which is, in a sense, an uh, ethnographic social science and economics approach to questions around irrigation and growth? Um, I would very much like to take the former mixed methods approach. And it's also related to questions around data uh, and uh, field study, and therefore it comes back to the question of the budget that's been applied. Um, a 50% social sciences approach will enable you to do research at about 100 grand per year. A more mixed methods approach incorporating field study, uh, productivity, natural resources, metrics, and so on and so forth, I think would be more expensive. Thank you. Okay, so are there any more on this side before we come back over there? Because we might not get to go around again. Hi, I'm Derek Carnegie from the OECD Development Institute. And I was curious, obviously the policy implications of the research are very important. I was curious if you, or how you see the implications uh, being included in a successful project. If uh, explicit recommendations would be part of the conclusions or if it's merely an issue of including something that can be relevant for policy. Thank you. Okay, and then, uh Yes, I think it was the lady down here who wanted to go. Oh, there's, another, there's another question over there. Should we catch that quickly before we go over to the other side? Yes, can you please explain a bit about countries under transition? How could we uh, implement policies and how proceed with application? With so, countries under transition? So you want a bit more information yes, on? Yes, okay. I think I missed it. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, this is, um, I, am, I was a researcher, but I have not come here with um, uh, any intention of applying for any research. But I just, because I am a victim of 60 years of conflict insensitive aid, I want to say something to you. One, um, Justice Veeramantri researched 
constitutions of developing countries. I don't know how many, I have never come across this in, um, in the online research, uh, that he researched these uh, constitutions of developing countries and they all tend towards authoritarianism. And just the best example is what is happening right now in Sri Lanka, and I am from Sri Lanka. Um, uh, this, uh, I am Sister Theris. Uh, last week, um, DP funded researchers produced this report at the ODI, uh, Horizontal Inequalities and the Conflict. This is, I hope all the researchers will bear this in mind. Systems, please, please, please. Uh, very good. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Now, again, it's free for all at top table. Who wants to go for, for these questions? I'll just try and make sure we answer them all. Somebody does. Does anybody want to start on anything? Uh, there was one about flexibility within the themes. Right. And across the themes and across cutting issues. Why are you issues. looking at me for that? Because um, <laughs> so you looked as if you might be about to say uh, something, a big yeah, mistake. Well, it's a <laughs> it's okay, the slide where. Yeah, do you have anything? No, I think. Red um, across the yeah, maybe, maybe Dirk would be, okay. um, that would be a good idea. But um, I mean, in general, as, as we said, one or more of the themes, and um, I'm not sure um, yeah, if, if specific questions aren't asked in the specification, can you ask these questions? I suppose you can. Um, if, Dirk, do you want to? Sure. I, mean, I understood the question as being um, um, if it is a sort of an overlapping in terms of diff uh, both themes, it's relevant for finance and innovation. Mm. And I think it would be brilliant uh, as well if it fits within the uh, theme, if you can make the case that it, uh, that it fits uh, within the questions, that would be brilliant. And, I, and when it comes to financial uh, innovation uh, or finan finance, uh, financial sector development and innovation, there are, there are two types of questions uh, in the call. And um, so on the one hand, there are discussions about uh, financial depth and how that can stimulate growth, uh, so financial debt versus regulation, and there, there are a range of questions on that. Um, so it fits within that, but it also fits within, uh, within the area that we, uh, we scoped out um, um, uh, um, on, uh, on the services sector and innovation. So how do the services sector um, service sectors affect uh, innovation in other sectors? How does a, uh, the performance of, uh, of the financial sector um, affect uh, the, the, the creation of, of new technologies, the spread of new technologies, um, and, and, and sort of imitation as well? So I think that uh, it fits in. So, um, so for this specific point, I can say, well, absolutely, that, uh, uh, it, it seems to be uh, important. I think in general, um, uh, with all of these uh, things, if you think you're not quite sure if it fits in, just make, uh, just, uh, well, you can ask us, but you can also uh, uh, just reread the questions and make the case that whatever you, uh, um, a topic you choose, um, well, uh, has a number of criteria, but at least relates to, to some of the questions within, uh, within the, um, the call. Um, is that to that point? I mean, I could, sorry, I put the wrong slide up. I don't know whether you wanted to refer to yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, I, so I mean, within this, uh, this slide, I think that, uh, um, so when you think about the second row, there were just discussions about financial sector and depth, and that uh, financial depth, uh, to what extent is that important uh, to, to, uh, uh, to, to contribute to growth? Um, uh, is, is, is too much depth uh, bad? Is, is, is a bit of depth is good? Uh, these are all uh, questions that are, where, the, uh, where the academia have, done, have recently done a lot of uh, interesting studies on. So it seems to me a relevant, uh, a relevant topic, but. I mean, I can't, I can't judge individual issues. Stefan, do you want to say something? Well, I'm, um, well I thought I was going to say, and then I thought maybe I'd just uh, check with, uh, with Dan whether this is the case, but I suppose it is possible that uh, somewhere in the process these, these proposals may be looked at a reviewer who is really concentrating only on one theme. Uh, and therefore, if you're going to you know, try and touch on more than one theme, then probably it's very worthwhile headlining that uh, so that such a reviewer will realize that uh, some of your content is uh, not simply away from the theme that they're concentrating on, but very much on another theme. Just highlight it, but um, uh, uh, is that correct? Yeah, no, I, yeah. I think that would be very helpful in any case. Um, By the final yeah. stages, there'll be no problem in touching on more than one theme yeah. because they'll all be uh, looked at together. Um, I suppose when I've got the mic, I thought I might just talk about the interdisciplinary question as well. I mean, I think uh, you're right that the, we've kind of tried to uh, set this in the economic literature more than more than other things. Though you know, economics is very broad anyway, so that that, that uh, uh, 
there's lots of different sorts of uh, uh, re research which are, we're trying to refer to. And um, we're very enthusiastic about multidisciplinary approaches. Uh, uh, and um, uh, I suppose uh, we're, we're still uh, primarily concerned about the viability of the research strategy and the relevance. So uh, uh, that, that's my answer there. Mm. So, um, yeah, maybe I could add to that if that, that's sort of half answering Bruce's question um, about the methodology, mixed methods versus uh, other choices. I kind of talked about that earlier on. We're not prejudiced uh, in, in that. Well, what we are aiming for is a very diverse panel of um, experts advising us on these applications. So we are not going to just get them from the RCT school or uh, wherever you might suspect them. So I, I guess we, we want to, to give your applications a fair hearing and if, it's the, if, it, if your methodology is appropriate, then it will be considered. Um, in terms of um, the expenses, of course, um, certain me methods are more expensive than others. Um, and I, I brought up this uh, average figure of 370,000 pounds per project. Um, we have in, if, just check out the the, the existing um, applic um, the, the the ones who were successful in the first round. There are ones that are um, almost nine hundred thousand pounds. So in in a way, it's it's open. Um, uh, so we have a minimum of one hundred thousand um, pounds, but that we haven't set a maximum. Obviously, we have a limited budget. Um, so and you you can calculate what that might be, and um, but yeah. So if if you can justify the costs, that is, I think, the key. For the, the research you want to undertake, then that's good, that's fine. So we're not going to judge you on, um, on the, the amount. It needs to be appropriate, it needs to be justified. Um, does that cover that? Okay. Louise, you're going to talk about impact. There's a couple of people asked about the sort of impact, uh, whether it's explicit on policy or just communicating the results of research is enough. Is that what you're going to respond to? Yes. Okay, perfect. Yeah. Hi, um, <coughs> thank you. I'm Louise Shackson, and I'm um, uh, the other half of the directorate with Dirk, the, the, the impact leader. Um, we're not looking for you to ascribe what impact you are going to have to claim that you're going to have some mighty impact and then work, you know, like anything to achieve that specific impact. We all know the nature of research. We all know, um, uh, you know, findings come in that are unanticipated or, or that, are, that are inconclusive. What we want to see, um, and I should say the ESRC impact toolkit is a very, very useful um, tool for helping you think through what are the types of impact that you might want to see so that ultimately you could come up with something as beautiful as um, what as, as Maureen presented in, in her pathways to impact. We want you to think about stakeholders. We want you to think about you know, who's going to benefit. We want you to think about how your research is going to contribute. Um, use the ESRC impact toolkit for that, for your proposal. That's what you need to follow. Okay? For successful applicants, we will then be working with them subsequently to try and deepen and make slightly more consistent what those definitions of impact are. But for the proposal stage, refer to the ESRC impact toolkit. That's all you need to look at, and you'll be judged, you'll be judged on that. Is there anything you want to add on that, Lindy? No. Um, very good. Uh, I think we've covered most of the questions except the last one. And Maureen, I was just going to come back to you on that. The lady from Sri Lanka talking about you know, the impact of research maps. So it seemed to me that your methodology is designed to avoid those sorts of problems. Um, would you like to talk I, more about that? I'm not sure I have a great deal to say. I mean, I think you were speaking about conflict in particular and conflict situations. Um, no, I'm, I'm not sure I have anything useful to... I mean, I, I took away a, 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 higher a higher level message from what you were saying, which was about there's all this research is being, which is being done in developing countries, which is driven by external researchers, and actually they should be focusing much more on the... Uh, you know, local needs and local capacity, and, uh, and, and the politics of it. Yeah, and the local this politics. Is six years, it has become now genocide. Who worries about it? Okay, I mean, I, th I think there are specific issues in, in, in Sri Lanka which we're not going to go into here, but I think the, yeah. the, the, the higher level point you're making about that this should be research which is relevant for uh, 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 local countries, local policy makers, working with local researchers, capitalizing on that experience, I think was illustrated very well in, in Maureen's, uh, Maureen's example. Research findings of natural sciences are made use of in nanoseconds, but it takes a genocide, not even a genocide, to make social 
Okay, very good. Thank you very much for that. That brings us uh, to tea time. So three o'clock uh, tea, unless anybody has got a burning question. But if you have, I suggest you reserve it for tea time. Uh, before we all go, I'd just like to introduce a few, a few other people. We've got a couple of people from uh, ESRC here. We've got uh, Lindy Griffin and Mary Day, who've already waved at you. If you have specific questions about ESRC, talk to them. Louise, who's already stood up and, uh, and, and waved at you uh, on, uh, on impact. And uh, Caroline, uh, who's at the back in the striker black top, she's the communications officer. If you want to know more about the communication stuff, talk to her. And just to say thank you very much to the speakers. Thank you very much to, uh, to the audience for your uh, questions. I hope we answered them. To stress uh, what Dan said, this is the beginning of a dialogue. Any more questions, send them to ESRC. Thank you all very much indeed. And shall we clap the speakers?